Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the STM Group review of results for 2020, uh, the sale of the Jersey and Gibraltar businesses and update on prospects. To start with, if we could cover a couple of housekeeping items. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, which you will see on your screens. Uh, throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. However, questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the have situated on the right-hand corner of your screen, or if anyone has dialed in via stm at warbrookpr.com. We will endeavour to answer all questions today. However, failing that, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. Finally, we would like to remind you that a copy of this presentation is being recorded. Uh, I would now like to hand you over to Chief Executive Alan Kentish and Chief Financial Officer Therese Nish. Alan, Therese. Thanks, Tom. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for tuning in to the STM Group PLC uh, final results presentation for 31st of December 2020. Or seems a little while ago now that the year ended. Um, probably by way of recap and just explaining a bit more of us as STM Group, then um, probably the best description of us is that we are administrators of client assets. Um, that, that administration comes in various formats, whether it's to do with trust and company business, uh, pensions business, or, or the life insurance wrappers, uh, portfolio bonds that we offer um, and there's as part of our development really we, we started off in the trust and company sector um, and that that history goes back to something in the 1990s um, and we floated on aim in in 2007 as part of a buy and build strategy um, but the reality is that we sort of really reinvented ourselves from 2012 and, and much more was the focus on pension administration uh, and life assurance and um, and as you might have noticed in the last uh, couple of months, uh, we have now um, disposed of our trust and company businesses. But one was in Gibraltar, one was in Jersey. Um, strategically, they've become less and less important to us and just wasn't the focus for us going forward. Um, where that leaves us really is very much about pensions administration and life assurance wrappers. Uh, our pensions uh, life journey started out in the expatriate market, which is where traditionally our trust and company businesses um, operated. Um, and we've got circa 11,000 CureOps members. Uh, CureOps, for all intents and purposes, is equivalent of an overseas SIP, um, albeit it's regulated in Gibraltar and Malta in our case, rather than from a UK scenario. Um, as part of as part of offering that CureOps um, product to the expatriates, during 2016-17, we identified that we were missing an opportunity rather than with not having something more UK-based. Um, and so strategically as a PLC, our, our view is that we should have something in the UK. Uh, we acquired uh, a small UK SIP business called London Colonial. Um, that actually came with a life, another life assurance business in, in Gibraltar. Um, and that became really our foothold for further expansion in, in terms of the UK market. Um, during 2018, we acquired the Kerry business, which is now rebranded re as Options. Uh, and that allowed us really to, first of all, integrate a, another SIP business so that we now have two SIP businesses in the UK. Um, but it also came with a really quite exciting proposition, which is in relation to uh, the fledging industry of the, the workplace pensions. Um, this is clearly a, it, it's a, it's a process that is following similar to the Australian market, in my view, in terms of superannuations, albeit they are much, much more mature as an industry. Um, but it's very much a, an exciting and dynamic uh, workplace environment in terms of that auto enrolment. And what we now have really, as bringing up today, is very much a focus in terms of growth in various areas. Our, what we'll see, you'll see is that um, we've exited our legacy businesses. Uh, our CureOps business, which is the Malta and Gibraltar business, provides a solid, steady, re recurring revenue base. Um, 
but it, it's become more complicated to grow. And our focus really in terms of growth, uh, organically and inorganically, um, is in relation to the UK market space. Um, looking at sort of our, our overall growth strategy, um, you know, I, I guess you know, all businesses will look at it in some form or other. Um, our expectations are that we'll uh, attract more clients from our existing range. Um, our sort of our sweet spot, if you like, in terms of the SIP and the QROPs is really sort of the 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 middle type middle tier SIP and the bespoke SIP. You know, might have commercial property and such like in it. Um, one of the ways that we envisage this this growth in terms of organic growth is really by looking at partnerships, um, and that might come with an existing uh, product arrangement or a slightly niche product and. Possibly a good example of that would be um, our partnership with Wahed Invest uh, to look at the basically a Sharia compliant product, uh, not just for the SIP market, but also for um, for the auto enrolment market. Uh, that in itself also has opportunities for us in terms of the, the international market for, for our expat client base. Um, so there is a focus really in terms of partnerships where these partners come with distribution and that will take a little bit of pressure off us in terms of that business development function. Clearly, organic growth is, is one pillar, um, but we've been reasonably active in terms of uh, acquisitions, etc., uh, and looking at this inorganic growth. Uh, the PLC board is very strongly behind that as, as complementary to us as a group. Um, uh, and where we sit today, the ability to acquire three, four million pounds of new revenue through, through a book of business, which might add one and a half million pounds of profit, it is clearly quite an attractive proposition. Um, we, we demonstrated last year um, the acquisition in terms of Barclay Burke. That's very much a complementary uh, acquisition in terms of the, the UK business side of things. Uh, there's a separate slide on there that will give a bit more background about the typical parameters that we'll look for in terms of those acquisitions. Um, it, it's fair to say that over the last two years, um, we've spent a, a lot of time, effort and energy in a number of key initiatives. Um, primarily, these have been around uh, the IT side of things. Uh, when we acquired the London Colonial business in 2016, it, it ran its own SIP business on an in-house administration system called BOSS. Most of the SIP industry, I think probably about 45, 50% of the SIP industry uh, uses the same software package called SIP Pro. Uh, and what we've tried to do is really use our own system to differentiate ourselves from it. Um, so we see that as becoming more and more important as a differentiator and a better customer journey uh, going forward. Um, so by the end of uh, this half year, we would have basically completed four IT projects. Um, three of them related to moving our SIP business and our two QROPS businesses uh, onto our own BOSS system so that we will have one system for um, our personal pension uh, initiatives, whether that's for the expatriate market or whether it's for the UK market. Um, and the other one relates to moving our auto enrollment business from a previous system, which uh, was described as clunky is probably the best phrase that most people use. Um, and we've moved it onto a much more flow through automated um, processing. Uh, clearly, this becomes massively important for the auto enrollment market where the, the fees per member um, are significantly less than, than in the personal pensions market. So that will see a continual drive for, to improve our operational efficiencies. In terms of trading jurisdictions, uh, again, what, you, what you'll see now is that Jersey um, won't be reappearing on this map from our point of view. Um, obviously, that's, we, we sold that. Uh, and we've got really three trading hubs. Malta and Gibraltar uh, offer the expatriate international market Gibraltar also has the, the life assurance businesses there, um, which offers a, a pension type product uh, called a flexible annuity to UK residents. Um, it also has uh, standard sort of portfolio bonds that some of the other life companies will, will offer to uh, as a tax deferral 
type product. Um, you'll see that our, our product range is reasonably widespread, um, certainly in terms of the UK market. I think we're one of the few pension providers that probably cover the, the two ends to, of the spectrum, if you like, from the, the bespoke sit right the way through to the workplace pensions. Uh, we actually see that as, as an interesting scenario because it, it will eventually evolve into that workplace pensions business growing to an extent where some of these members will by default be taking out uh, a SIP just as that, that pension pot grows. Um, and, you know, a few statistics, we're just just over 300 people at the end of December, uh, 200 and over 200,000 customers uh, in 126 countries. And I'll hand over to Therese in terms of looking at the financial highlights for 2020. Thank you, Alan. So, um, in, over the last few years, we've had uh, some one-off transactions um, affecting our profit and loss account that we do not believe um, reflect sort of the underlying nature of the underlying sort of operations of, of the business. These transactions could be changes in accounting policy as a result of acquisitions or things like the reserves um, on the insurance company that have been released over the last few years since we acquired it. So more and more we've been looking at underlying uh, measures as an alternative performance measure just to give an idea of how the business is truly performing. So for 2020 there were actually no transactions that affected revenue and therefore the underlying revenue of 24 million matches the reported revenue. In terms of profitability, uh, there's been a few transactions, nothing compared to sort of the previous years where we had the bargain purchase gain on acquisition of about 2 million in, in 2019. So underlying measures uh, matching reported measures a little bit more um, in 2020. And in terms of that profitability, we've seen a, a, a slight decrease in 2020 which has obviously affected our underlying profit margins as well. That's largely as a result of our costs, which increased in 2019, quarter four of 2019 specifically, around the professional indemnity insurance premiums. And, and that's an increase that was seen right across the market and, and not just specific for STM. So 2019 saw um, that uh, a qu one quarter of that increased costs, whereas in 2020 we're seeing a full year of costs. One of our sort of key, um, main key performance indicators is uh, recurring revenue, and pleasingly that continues to increase year on year. So in 2020, as, as we continue to grow primarily our pensions business, um, our recurring revenue is also increasing so that in 2020 it's up to 85%, which totals 20, just over 20 million. Um, also in this year, the board has approved a final dividend of 0.85p, which brings our total dividends for the year to 1.4p, and slightly lower than last year as a result of the rebasing that we did on following the final 2019 dividend on, on the back of the financial uncertainties around the global pandemic. But what we have seen is that it, it's important to note that we continue to pay dividends and, and have done um, for X number of years or, uh, in the past. Finally, on, on this slide, the cash and cash equivalents. So the balance net of borrowings at the end of the year was 14.8 million. Uh, that's down on last year, largely as a result of the acquisitions that, that we did in 2020, the Barclay Burke, and also having to pay deferred consideration on, on the previous acquisitions. Um, pleasingly, though, cash flow from operating activities continues to match um, PBT, so it shows that the business is, is clearly cash generative. In terms of operational highlights, I don't think anyone could really look back and say that they predicted the, the craziness of 2020 in terms of the whole uh, COVID-19 and the potential implications to, to businesses. Um, I guess the reality is, as STM, as a pension uh, administrator, um, we're actually we're incredibly fortunate. Um, you know, the one thing that this that year did demonstrate to me is the 
absolute predictability of our recurring revenue. And it's, it's this, this underlying revenue that really is the, the pillar and the foundations of our business. Um, it, it, it's particularly so the fact that our fees uh, almost entirely are based on fixed fees. So we're not beholden to the, the fluctuations in terms of markets, uplifts and, and downfalls, etc. Um, I think there was a, an announcement last year that there was a circa a, a 0.4 million impact on our revenue overall um, based on that 24 million. So uh, a fairly immaterial amount in terms of that context. Um, I guess the other thing that, that, that basically 2020 taught us is that there's potentially better and more efficient ways of working. Um, what, what we were able to do uh, with minimal impact in terms of service levels, et cetera, to our, to our clients uh, was to really move our whole administration into a working from home environment uh, in the various jurisdictions and, and abiding by the government legislation and guidelines uh, as and when they popped up, uh, sometimes on a conflicting and daily basis. Um, but actually, we, we managed to, to, to run the affairs of the business uh, in an orderly manner. Um, looking at the other achievements that we, we achieved in terms of the, the reflecting on that IT um, efficiencies that we talked about, um, ultimately, there was four, or there is four big projects that were undertaken in 2020. Uh, two of them have now gone live. Uh, one went live at the end of the year, one went live at the beginning of February, and the other two will go live back end of this month or beginning of next month. Um, and again, this will help us to improve our, our margins, uh, something that is uh, fundamental to, to our three-year strategy. Um, that those those margins will be improved partly by uh, reduction in software license fees, um, such things as as Cipro and, and Division, uh, but also some of the efficiencies around resources, so that we expect to be able to grow our our revenue line without putting on the same level of expenses onto the onto the the property the cost line. And I think in terms of that technology, that this going to, in my view, become more and more important to, to us as a small uh, niche provider to be a differentiator in the market. And, and it's working with these partners uh, to get that distribution. Um, I think one of the other things that really is worth highlighting in terms of 2020 is, is looking at that auto enrollment business. Um, when we acquired the, the Kerry business in 2018, uh, the yeah, sorry, we acquired it in 2018, but we got um, FCA approval in the beginning of 2019. Um, during 2019, we knew that it hadn't got to critical mass. I think it lost 600,000 in, in 2019. It lost 300,000 in 200, um, 2020. Um, and it's pleasing to say that we've now got onto the other side of the hockey stick curve, so to speak, that the business is now profitable and is incredibly scalable. Um, and our drive, there's a, there's a slide in terms about membership, so I, I won't steal uh, Theresa's thunder. Um, but now it's about growing that membership book. One of the, the biggest frustrations for me in terms of 2020, though, is in relation to our one of our life assurance products, which is the flexible annuity. But for all intents and purposes, it's similar to a, a UK SIP. It's aimed at the, the UK market. Um, it, it's got a nice pipeline of, of, of building. Um, however, we're still slow to see that conversion into to actually new business. Um, and this is a, a focus very much for 2021 as to how do we accelerate that conversion rate? Because um, the pipeline justifies the time and effort to, to ensure that we can get that conversion. Despite the whole of the 2020s, um, COVID scenario, we've, we've actually been fairly successful in terms of the, the acquisition, acquisition we did, um, but also looking at other possibilities in the market. So we've been fortunate enough where we've announced something and we continually reiterate that we're, we're in the market for acquisitions, that we get to see uh, a reasonable number of information, information memorandums. 
and private contacts from you know, possibly family-owned businesses about who are looking to exit in terms of their, their pension administration business. So we will continue to, to look at these opportunities. Um, again, in terms of the disinvestment, we've um, exited those two non-core businesses. Um, and finally, something that's sort of, there's a slide on it that's, that's very detailed in, in the back of the, the pack. Um, it would be remiss of me not to mention the Kerry Adams case. Um, I guess this is going to become the, probably the leading precedent in terms of the SIP industry as to what is expected of a pension administrator, um, a SIP provider, uh, in relation to due diligence, assets, etc. Um, and also how interaction is carried out with introducers, whether they're regulated or unregulated. In a snapshot, um, where we stand today is that the, the Court of Appeal found in favour of Carey, which is, is now being rebanded options in relation to conduct of business, uh, that actually acting, if following instructions on, from a client uh, and acting on those um, is deemed to be in the interest of the client, uh, despite the investment not necessarily being what the client should invest in. Um, I, I guess from my point of view, self-invested pe personal pension is, is sort of a, a view that actually has been upheld by the, the Court of Appeal. However, we did lose on uh, the concept of can, a, can a, an unregulated introducer end up straying into giving regulated advice and what are the implications um, on the, the SIP industry. Um, that decision went against uh, us. Um, what we have done is we've submitted a, a request to appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, there's more detail behind the, the, the criteria and circumstances in, in the slide in the pack. But probably from the point of view of a, an investor or a potential investor into the STM group, the most important thing that comes out of this is that actually our, when we did our due diligence on Carey, we were fully aware of this case. Uh, we were comfortable that the PI insurance uh, had deep enough pockets and was robust enough to ensure that even in an Armageddon case where uh, any particular claims against us for distressed assets became apparent, that there would be no financial impact. Uh, and that's exactly the case. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's exactly the case. So. So there is actually no financial impact as a result of this case, and nor if there's any similar cases in relation to that. And I think that's, you know, I'm not sure necessarily the whole of the civil industry could say that because we were fortunate enough that the PI policy attaching to Kerry was uh, very significant. In terms of COVID uh, implications, um, I think probably I've, I've sort of covered that off in general terms. The key being that actually we were able to clearly demonstrate that we can manage that business despite some unprecedented times. Um, it has slowed down some of our interactions with uh, intermediaries. Uh, whilst we did well in terms of growing the auto enrolment book um, and memberships, some of those conversions, particularly of some of the bulk memberships, took a lot longer and therefore detracted from what I would have liked to have seen as revenue in 2020. <coughs> Acquisitions and disposals. I won't talk much about the Barclay Burke acquisition, a relatively small acquisition, um, 1.7 million revenue. Once it's integrated, it delivers 0.6 million of EBITDA, which is roughly PBT uh, for, for the, the business. Probably the most important thing about that is it's similar to the type of acquisition, acquisitions that we will look for in the future, somewhere between one and three million of revenue typically, uh, where we would expect a 30% drop of peak to, to profit um, once we've integrated it. Um, and I think our parameters, we've seen some fairly eye-watering uh, multiples of revenue that people have paid uh, for businesses. What I think 
our parameters really are somewhere between one and two times revenue. Um, and I think we're fortunate that the, the pond that we're fishing in at, at the lower end is less exciting to the, some of the larger players and some of our peers uh, because it just doesn't move the, the profit dial for them where they acquire something that might have 0.6 million. Whereas clearly from our point of view, uh, it is a nice enhancement of profitability. Um, and therefore, we're not seeing as much competition on pricing as potentially we could have done. Uh, we continue to see um, opportunities come, coming our way. And my, my expectations are certainly as part of our strategy that we, we hope to be able to announce further acquisitions during 2021. Um, in terms of the exit of the businesses of, of, of Gibraltar and Jersey, Probably not huge amounts to say, reasonable result in terms of what we achieved uh, from a consideration point of view. Um, but probably more importantly, it's uh, getting rid of a distraction for an area of the business that just wasn't part of our, our strategy going forward. And I think as part of our overall strategy going forward, um, and there's a, there's a slide further in the appendices, uh, one of the initiatives that we we are looking at and we are aware is that our, we're fairly heavily capital capital intensive in terms of our regulated businesses and particularly in the life two life companies that we have um, and then we've got a specific project ongoing project um, with consultants as to how do we bring down that capital uh, and ideally release uh, additional resources going forward which can then be redeployed into the business. Therese will look at more of the revenue breakdown there. Looking at the revenue contribution by operating segment, so no surprises that clearly pensions is still by far the largest division at 69%, so 16.5 million from the pensions, and the increase in that is largely as a result of the acquisitions so both the options acquisition that happened in February 2019, so 2020, we're recognising a full year of revenue and, and profit contribution, and the Berkeley Burke acquisition that took place in August of 2020. In terms of the life business, um, there's a separate slide where we'll see the breakdown of that life. Uh, and whilst on the face of it, it looks like revenue has gone down by a million, it is actually as a result of the technical reserve release that took place in, in 2019. It was the last of this reserve that we acquired as part of the London and Colonial acquisition. Um, when we acquired that, it had three million pound reserve, which over the years, the actuary has been recommended, recommending to the board that it be released. And, and the last release happened in 2019. And the trust and company management division decreased in the year as a result of natural attrition, clients closing down their structures. And, and clearly it's, it's a division that wasn't core for us and we subsequently sold since the year end. Looking at the recurring revenue, we can see that pensions and life assurance by far the highest that have that recurring revenue at 93, 94%. And that for 2021, we'd actually expect recurring revenue percentage to obviously increase as a result of the companies and trust management division no longer being part of the group. couple of slides now um, looking at the pensions, well, at the individual um, divisions, but in terms of the pensions, we've got a number of slides looking at the entity count. Um, so we can see on this slide that the SIPs and the SASs have grown both through acquisition and organically. So the 156 SAS members that came through the Berkeley Burke acquisition and then the organic growth, both the UK and international six growing um, throughout, the, throughout the year, a, a higher figure than, than we um, took on in, in 2019. And what we've seen in, in 2020, uh, I suppose it sort of makes sense individuals during a time of financial uncertainty sort of 
hold back making financial decisions in terms of their pensions and their savings because we have seen the attrition rate for the UK SIPs actually go down. So last year, 2019, 2018, we were typically seeing 7 8% of attrition in the UK SIPs, and that's gone down to 4%. In terms of the international SIPs, that's pretty stable at 3%, which is what we were seeing on the QROPs when we first started um, selling QROPs uh, way back in 2012, 13 and 14. Um, over the last year, we've seen QROPs increase, the attrition rate increase to sort of 5 6%. That's largely as a result of the QROPs um, in, in Malta um, and the ageing sort of population of that client portfolio. Um, Malta has got flexi access abilities and therefore as individuals are sort of hitting the sort of the age where they can draw down their full pensions, then they are taking advantage of it. Um, the average member of our client portfolio still remains at 55. And what we're seeing is that the flexi access, the, the drawing down of, of pensions is typically at age 65. So it's not that we expect that percentage to sort of um, increase significantly over, over the next couple of years. The next slide is specifically on auto enrollment, um, our corporate um, business uh, options corporate uh, and what we can see on that top slide is, is how we've grown um, in terms of that, that membership um, over over 2020. So in the, in the 10 months since we acquired um, in 2019, we put on a, a net 40,000 members and that's increased to about 70,000 in 2020 and, and we expect that figure to be similar for 2021. Um, and, and in terms of that revenue, um, again, contributing a, a million to the annual fees. And like Alan said earlier, that, that business is now pleasingly, is, it's now sort of turned the corner and is now um, profitable on, on a monthly basis. This slide then shows the revenue um, for our pensions business. So as we can see on the, the QROPs line, fairly stable, 10.1 million compared to, to last year, um, and the increases predominantly and, and the SIP um, as a result of the acquisition and also the organic growth that we saw on the previous slides, and then the auto enrollment uh, an increase from 1.3 million to 2.2 million, again, as we saw on the previous slide, purely as a result of that organic growth. In terms of the life businesses, we can see here quite clearly how the 950,000 of um, the technical reserve, how that sort of, sort of uh, how, how that broke down sort of in, in the 2019 figures where our annual fees were 3.6 and, and that's fairly sort of stable with, with the 2020 figures of the, the annual fees for 3.5 million as well. So clearly the new business um, sort of compensating for the natural attrition on, on the on the existing client portfolio. And finally, the, the in terms of revenue breakdown, the trust on and company business that so that we since since the year end disposed of clearly showing uh, sort of attrition from last year and, and split between Gibraltar and, and Jersey. It's worth, probably worth just touching upon sort of our acquisition strategy. Uh, primarily, our acquisition strategy um, is about integration of businesses similar to what we have. And I guess the reality is that most of these acquisitions are going to be in the UK. We've seen a number of books of business in the Curops market, i.e. Malta and Gibraltar, um, but given the potential exposure to some of the underperforming assets within those books, uh, it's not within our risk appetite. So I think we'll probably struggle to acquire any other Curox books of business. So there's one or two out there, but it, it's a lot more complicated. Um, and I think that sort of really brings us back to much more about this UK focus that we have generally in, in terms of both product offerings um, and business expansion. Um, and very much we're looking at uh, family owned SIP businesses, etc., uh, that fit those parameters, that one to three million revenue, 
uh, that, that have sort of got that long-standing client base. Um, probably the, the ownership hasn't really got any succession planning. Um, and we've been able to demonstrate previously that we've, we've looked after the clients, we've looked after the staff. So our expectations are that we will continue to be to see opportunities in terms of the particular the SIP and the SAS books. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't look at opportunities for basically vertical integration, um, particularly where it, it might be that there's an acquisition that primarily fits within what we currently do, but there's an extension or, or additional services. Um, so it would be more complementary rather than necessarily just going out and looking for something that we don't currently do. Um, the workplace pension solutions and interesting the auto enrollment business. Uh, when we took the decision to acquire Kerry back end of 2018 and approval in 2019, uh, the master trust process was just starting to require authorization by the pension regulator, the TPR. Um, at the time, the, there were 90, I think 91. Uh, sort of players in the market that would classify themselves as having a master trust. Uh, after the authorization process, I think that dropped to 38, uh, and there's currently, I think, 34 uh, remaining. Uh, my assessment is that we're probably, as, as options corporate, we're probably about nine or ten uh, in terms of size. Um, there's there's invariably going to be more consolidation in this in this area. Uh, and certainly, we hope to be able to pick up uh, additional acquisitions in that area. Um, pricing is still very much um, an uneducated uh, approach. So you've got certain books of business that might be held by, say, unions, etc., where it's about protecting their membership and handing it over to a good home, uh, whereas others would look at it as a really saleable asset. So. Um, there's, I think there's going to be certainly opportunities for additional acquisitions in this area. Uh, but perhaps the other area of where we can grow that um, in terms of bulk transfers is really dealing with the likes of um, the intermediaries, the accountants, the lawyers, the um, employee benefit consultants, um, uh, the HR advisors that are looking for, to work with partners, with auto-enrollment partners that possibly offer a more personalized service rather than essentially some of the, the larger players, um, possibly uh, offer a wider range of um, model investments rather than perhaps one, one master trust only offering a, a range of funds from one fund provider. Uh, and we've been reasonably successful in 2020 in terms of some of these transfers for 10, 15,000 members. Um, and on average, of between, say, £15 and £18 uh, per member per year. So it shows how efficient we have to be in terms of the, the actual processing. Um, but obviously, you know, 100,000 members uh, is 1.5 million in revenue. So suddenly 15,000 members it is definitely a nice revenue uplift to, to go for. Um, and certainly that is part of our strategy in terms of working with, with some of these partners. Finally, in terms of summary and outlook, um, I guess 2021 sort of, everyone's still scratching their head in terms of the, the whole COVID. Life is becoming more, more straightforward. Um, Clearly, as we all know, travel, etc., et is still complicated and difficult. Um, where we sit today is we move forward. We're, we're meeting uh, to numbers of meeting management's expectations. Uh, there's no change to our, you know, this this foundation uh, relating to this recurring revenue that we have, and that really does underpin the profitability of the business. Um, the opportunity, and if you like, the challenge to us is to ensure that as all of these IT projects come to an end, that the expectations of those uh, savings um, in terms of becoming more efficient, uh, savings in terms of software licenses, starts to come through in, in the second half of this year. Um, as it stands today, things are on track, so there's no reason to, to think that that wouldn't be the case. Um, 
So ultimately, there'd be minimal impact really to us in terms of existing business. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's, as I alluded to previously, our, our challenge really is to accelerate that new business take up, um, particularly on the flexible annuity, uh, to finalise some of these partnerships arrangements and move it from what is a is a, an agreement um, in terms of a partnership to actually starting to see more of this business coming through. Um, a, again, as a product provider, if, if the pressure's on the, the partner as the, as the provider of the distribution, then you know for us that's a match made in heaven. We will see further acquisitions um, during the year. I, I've no doubt about that. Uh, we'll continue to refine our capital management strategy, so uh, we will become more efficient in terms of how much capital do we use across us as a group. Um, this, in turn, will free up additional cash resources. Um, we'll invariably start to see our brand of options being more the central core brand for the group. Currently, we've obviously used the STM brand, we've got the London Colonial brand, um, and the recently launched, i.e. last year, uh, options brand. From an investment case, sitting here today, um, and as a reasonably large shareholder, the, the share price, in my view, for the group of what we do, what we've demonstrated, um, we are undervalued. Um, I think the, the FinCap note, in terms of the research note, puts our enterprise value, i.e. the difference between market cap uh, and cash, at circa four million. Um, cash has obviously gone up since we've made those disposals, so uh, our enterprise value is, is pretty minimal in terms of the context of our longevity in terms of this recurring revenue, uh, this, this, this annuity stream of, of revenue. Um, we've got, I think, now down to what is a much more simplified group in terms of what do we do before it was we, we were just expats or we would do too much trust and company, this funny stuff that doesn't quite fit with what people understand. So from, a, from a, an investment prospect, I think we're a much simpler group to understand and a much more UK-centric group. And I think that can only, can only make things easier for, for investors to understand in terms of what we, what we do and what we offer. Um, from my point of view, you know, I think the next two to three years is quite exciting. We've, we've certainly got our three-year strategy and where we where we are aiming for, um, and hopefully you'll be along for the ride. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Therese. Um, now, if we could just turn to the questions. Uh, we have a number of questions that were submitted ahead of the presentation. Um, however, please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right-hand corner of your screen. Um, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and published Q&A, can be accessed by your Investor Meet Company dashboard on the platform. Um, and additionally, your feedback is important to the company. So immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide that feedback. Um, while you're submitting questions, let us first have a look at some of those submitted ahead of the event. Um, I'd just like to say uh, we have answered a few of those questions in the course of the presentation, particularly around cash, um, and therefore we won't re revisit those. Um, Alan, you referred to the uh, the FinCap note. There's also a question here about forecasts, and I would encourage people to go to the FinCap website and to register yourselves such a, so that you can therefore access that. We can't share that information on this platform, but but it is available to investors um, if, you, um, if you disclose as a, as a sophisticated investor. Um, there are a couple of questions here which are quite technical in nature, and therefore um, we will respond to those in writing. Um, but, but maybe, Alan, we can just follow on from your investment case a little bit. One of the questions here looks a little at long-term vision. Um, what is the intended destination of this business in 10 or 20 years, and what is management doing today to increase the probability of arriving at that destination? Um, I suspect 10 to 20 years is a bit optimistic, but maybe if you could give us a five-year view, that would that would be helpful. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I guess uh, 20 years, um, I certainly won't be sitting where I am today, um, and nor should I be. Uh, I guess for me, probably, if we looked at a five-year horizon, um, where we are, where we are now, 
we will very much still be in the space of um, pension administration and life assurance. I, I don't see that changing significantly. I think what we'll see, and to be fair, I think it, it's an industry thing as well, is that our margins will improve. You, you've got other peers out there that are, are aiming at a 30% margin. I see absolutely no reason why we wouldn't be at that uh, similar range. Um, I think when we look at drill down a bit more, we'll probably be significantly more revenue will be UK based. Um, I I think the auto enrolment industry is a is a fascinating area. You know, if you look at the Australian market, it, it's absolutely dominated. It's a, a billion dollar industry. It's absolutely dominated by five or six players. Um, and in terms of trustees, uh, our opportunity stroke challenge is to make sure that we are one of the, the, the five or six that remain standing at that point in time. Um, as I say, we, I think we're probably about number nine or ten at the moment. Uh, either way, it's, it's a business that will grow uh, both organically um, in, in terms of the fact that you've always got uh, people starting work for the first time, they've left their university or wherever, um, they started work, so they will be a requirement. You'll have people that have left a job, uh, so they become a preserved member, but their job's then replaced by another individual, um, and they become a new member. So there's statistics talk about a, a typically a, an embedded 10% growth uh, in the markets in, in that side of things. So I would see that that revenue will continue to, to grow significantly um, over the next five years. And I think the the winners in terms of up the the industry, and, and certainly we recognise that we believe we need to be there in terms of differentiating, will be those that make the customer experience easier and more user friendly. I, I think it's a phrase that's, that's overly used, but I don't actually think necessarily the SIP industry and the pension industry generally is, is particularly good at, at that. Um, I guess that the one that's sort of jumped out and certainly in terms of evaluation of where they stand is pension B and certainly that focus on the IT I think is what uh, you will see from, from us uh, to ensure that we're at, sort of the, at the top of the industry as well. Um, so more of the same but probably accelerating in, in, in short Tom. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, just a couple of questions now around um, acquisitions margin and available cash for those. But if I can just start with, um, is it the board's policy to acquire several smaller pension targets or a single larger transformational one? Uh, and what is the rationale behind this approach? Um, I, I don't think it's an either or. I think the reality is that as a smaller business, um, it's easier for us to continue to sort of almost like a bit like to one of these Pac-Man things and sort of acquire smaller businesses, bolt them in uh, to our existing business and move on. Um, so that is what I would see as bread and butter. Um, having said that, we certainly wouldn't rule out a, a transformational deal. I think the problem we have at the moment where we stand in terms of size, market cap um, and share price in relation to, to, to how we value the business is that a transformational deal where we started to have to look at issuing paper would be quite dilutive in terms of an overall uh, proposition of something significantly large. Um, I think, you know, as a group, uh, as STM, we've got uh, a credit line of five and a half million. I think, Therese, we've drawn down. 1.6 million. So we only drawn, drawn down 1.6 million on that. We've got a, a fairly decent free cash balance um, within our balance sheet. So we could acquire something that would help to significantly increase profit without necessarily calling it transformational. Um, I think the issue we would have in terms of a really large deal would be just how dilutive it is uh, in terms of uh, paper. Right, okay, super. Well, actually maybe we can just look at that cash element because there are two questions that hang together here. Um, which we might just uh, pose to you. Um, the first of the questions is, is there anything that can be done on the reg cap requirements structurally within the business? And then that links in with, um, please explain your free cash and how much you could use 
to make an acquisition or return to shareholders via dividends or buybacks. So I think those two are interrelated. Yes, they, they very much are actually, and very, very good questions. Um, so in terms of the actual regulatory capital requirements, so they're, they're fairly sort of prescriptive in, in how they're sort of calculated, fairly sort of form, formulaic. In, in, in terms of the um, trustee businesses, so sort of uh, around the, the pensions business, it, it largely um, on the back of sort of the, um, the the amount of expenses, so typically sort of three months worth of expenses. With the six, it's also sort of to do with the assets that are held, um, the the investments, uh, and finally on on the life assurance, um, which um, w w can be seen on on the appendix. And um, in terms of the life assurance, they're sort of largely actuarially driven, so very much dependent on sort of assumptions that are made in terms of things like some sort of policy costs and where investments are, are held so possibly little that can be done in terms of changing that that structure it, it is something that like alan said earlier we are looking at with advisors and uh, particularly around the life companies could changing the assumptions could doing something with those two companies could that reduce that um, in terms of how much free cash we've got, um, clearly subsidiaries are profitable and therefore dividend paying, so they are transferring funds up to group. So our free cash is, is typically sort of how much cash we hold at group level in terms of that treasury function, and it's typically sort of in the region of one to two million pounds, and clearly, as, as I was saying earlier, very much cash generative so that's continually sort of flowing up to group um, as alan mentioned we've got that credit facility of which we've only drawn 1.6 million so we've got a, a balance in terms of that credit plus those additional um, profits that continue to come up from group just to, to add to Teresa's comments uh, and for those really interested in the regulatory cap requirements there is that slide that sort of breaks it down and what is absolutely clear and, and stands up like a sore thumb is that the, the fact that the life assurance businesses use around about 11 million of our 18 million uh, capital requirements. Um, obviously that's where the focus is as to how do we improve that capital. One of the things with the Solvency 2 calculation is it's incredibly actuarially driven and it depends on market rates. So, even our solvency criteria can move fairly significantly depending whether you use an A-rated bank or a double A-rated bank um, because of the weightings. Uh, what, what is probably in a higher helicopter view is that we've got two life companies in, in Gibraltar. Um, both have the, the same, in effect, product range. Both have the same licenses uh, and passporting requirements, albeit that both are limited uh, in, in terms of that now as a result of Brexit. So clearly there is, there is an argument you can bolt the two together. That's certainly a, a, a project that we've looked at. Uh, there is an argument that actually whatever you do in one company, you can do in the other company. So do we really need to anyway? Um, so this is some, very much an exercise that is, is real and, and now in terms of uh, ongoing. Great. OK, super. Uh, just a quick one around the IT projects. Um, how much margin improvement do you expect from the new IT infrastructure benefiting the group? And what margin pickup would you also expect to see on acquisitions utilizing the new systems? Thank you, Tom. So um, in terms of the IT, I think Alan mentioned earlier that clearly the savings are going to be twofold. So the savings will come from a, um, re reduction in license costs. Uh, as well as enhanced efficiencies and, and therefore reduction in, in resources required. Um, we're expecting the savings to be sort of in the region of half a million on those. Um, clearly, that doesn't necessarily mean that we will reduce our costs by half a million, but rather that we can add to that top line without increasing costs much. And, and, and as we mentioned earlier, that FinCap paper it very much shows that uh, an increase in the revenue line with minimal increases in our expenses moving towards a 20% a bit the margin for 2022 and, and absolutely in terms of acquisitions 
the, the fact that we now have two platforms, two core systems, one for our pen chip, one for our six SASs and, and QROPs, and the other one for our auto enrollment means that any new acquisitions will automatically go on either one of those on those um, core systems. So we'll also benefit from those from those enhanced margins. Great. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, we're coming up to the hour, so I've got three quick questions. Um, how do you view the distribution of a dividend versus the opportunity to reinvest that cash in higher returning acquisition opportunities, given the strong pipeline of acquisition opportunities that appears to be emerging? Um, yeah, for, for me, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think the starting point is that we have a number of institutions that expect a, a dividend in, in terms of their they're an income stock, uh, an income fund, or et cetera. Um, and I think my view is that it sows a level of certainty in the market in terms of our expectations in, in performance, et cetera. Um, having said that, I think typically our payout in terms of the, the, the cover two to three. is two to three times in terms of the cover of, of profitability. So uh, by default, we're not we're not paying out 70 or 80 percent of our profits because i do think uh, you know as i think the, the question alludes to is that there are acquisitions out there if we can acquire something that's got basically uh, a maximum of five-year payback then we as a business are, are really driving shareholder value by reutilizing that so i think it's a balance it, it's it's we're not going to say that we've got so many acquisitions on the go that we're not going to pay a dividend i think those that have invested in us uh, with an expectation that we are predictable and we can therefore manage our cash uh, would be upset. Um, but I'm very conscious that we have got potential opportunities as well. So I think our, our, our sort of dividend policy, um, I think everyone describes it as progressive. I'm, no one's actually told me what progressive means yet, but um, but it, it's not going to be it's not going to be volatile. It's not going to jump up one year and then go down the next year. Uh, subject to COVID and pandemics, etc. Um, so the expectations are that the remainder of the cash will be reinvested in the business. Great. Okay. Uh, last two, um, Alan, one for you. You did touch on it a little bit in the investment case. Um, what do you think the market is missing or misunderstanding about the business as the valuation looks light? That's a really good question. And, and I have to say, I, I scratch my head most evenings just trying to ponder and think about that. Um, I think in the past we have um, disappointed shareholders. Um, you know, I think there's been a, a case where we've been chasing a number, uh, and actually, on reflection, we, we've invested in the business, so we, we made the right decisions. But the short termism of chasing a number has meant that we've disappointed because we've then taken a, a slight downgrade. Um, so I, I think it's. That's primarily. I think if you go back four years or so, we were we were seen as sort of yeah, you, you're the guys with the expatriates. Um, but how long is that product going to last? Um, the reality is, the product's there for the next 20, 25 years, or until the, the last person takes their pension. Um, so I think that that sort of works fine. I think probably the other thing is that we we were seen as rather quite complicated. You know, we had businesses in Jersey that didn't really fit the pension administration. Uh, this sort of sexy thing called trust and companies, but you know, surely HMRC is all over that type of thing. So, so I think there's a lot of noise around that, those areas. I, mean, I guess where we stand today, you know, in a, in a very brief snapshot, is we're probably two and a half. Some, one of our peers, for instance, could spend probably two and a half times the size of us in revenue. They're probably about three times the size of us in terms of profit, and then they're about ten times our market cap. Um, so, I see that as an opportunity. It's a matter of demonstrating and delivering to the market, and then the re-rating has to come. You know, it's it, it's inconceivable that it doesn't come. Great. Okay. Uh, final question as we are coming up to the hour and I look out the window and it's uh, rain coming sideways, 40 miles an hour winds. Um, why is the chief executive based overseas? Is the chief executive involved in other businesses external to STM? And please don't be too smug. Okay. So I'm not going to say I'm looking out the window and the sun's shining. Um, 
the reality is, I think it's more historic than anything, to be honest. Um, we, as, we grew up and we floated when we were a Gibraltar business. Uh, our intention for floating was a buy and build strategy in, in, in what is the offshore sector, the, the, you know, the, the JTCs of this world, the Sanes that have businesses in the Channel Islands, Gibraltar, etc. Um, I've been based out in, uh, based in Gibraltar, live in Spain for the last 20 plus years. What both myself and Therese as the CFO have committed to, certainly for the last three years, um, is that we spend 50% 50, 50 of our time in the UK and 50% of our time uh, elsewhere outside of the UK. Um, I think what the only one thing that COVID has demonstrated to me is that actually it is you do have the ability to run a business really from anywhere, providing you've got the right technology and you have the right ability to communicate with with basically all your stakeholders. It's not just about um, my, you know, my work colleagues, etc. It's it's all stakeholders. Um, as life gets back to normal, I, I'm back to spending 50% of my time, if not more, in the UK. Great. Okay. Look, very very helpful. Thank you indeed. Um, so thank you for updating investors today. Um, could I ask investors not to close this session, as you will now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback. Um, if anyone has any further questions or would like additional information on STM, please do get in touch via STM at warbrookpr.com. As I said, some of the more technical questions we will respond to, and you will be notified when those Q and when the answers are published. Uh, many thanks for attending today's presentation. We look forward to updating you again shortly. Indeed. Thank you, everyone.